First John chapter 2, we have been looking at this um, this topic of assurance now for some weeks. We've, we've looked at some other things as well as we've gone through 1 John, but mainly we've been looking at this theme of assurance. And this is one of the greatest things we need. One of the devil's primary ways of tripping up the Christian is by making the Christian doubt the love of God and the forgiveness of Christ and we go through life, and we're, we're up and down, we don't know exactly where we're at, and maybe we're saved, maybe not. How can we serve God when we think we're on a sinking ship? What the Lord wants for us as Christians in 1 John is for us to know for sure we are converted, that our sins, not some, not the big ones, but all of our sins are gone and forgiven. He wants us to know that, that we may have joy and serve God. That's God's will for us as Christians. That's one reason this is so important we've been looking at. The other reason this is so important is because not only does He want Christians to have assurance, but He wants the hypocrites, those who think they're Christians, those who, and, and unfortunately, there's many of those in our area, our Bible Belt area. He wants many people to be awakened and to understand that they're not Christians. You know, you, you'll run into people like this sometimes. You know, why are you going to heaven for? And they'll say to you, well, I've lived a pretty good life. Uh, why are you going to heaven for? Well, I've, I was baptized when I was a little kid. Well, why are you going to heaven for? Well, I walked down an aisle one day and I just felt good and I, I think everything's good now. Now, all those things may have happened, but that doesn't mean you're a Christian necessarily. So, one of the purposes of 1 John as well is to awaken men and women of their state and to save them from eternal ruin. We have looked so far in 1 John at three big tests. That's, 1 John is mainly a series of tests that, that speak to us, that show us where we're at and try to give us proofs of salvation so we can judge ourselves by that. That's what 1 John is mainly about. One of the big tests that we saw is that we believe in a real Jesus. That's one of the main things that we have seen so far. One of the ways we know we're a Christian is that we believe in the true Jesus. He is fully God. He's uncreated. And yet He's man as well. And He looked at that in the first four verses of this letter. The next big general test that we've looked at is about sin. Christians take sin very seriously. We do not want to sin. We, When we do sin, we don't deny it. We confess it to God. We saw that. And then last week we saw that God commandments that He gives us, the Christian takes the commandments of God very seriously. In fact, not only do they take them seriously, they obey them. That's one of the ways we know we are Christians. In fact, just look down, read verse 3 and 4 with me because it goes into the message this morning. It says, By this we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. The one who says, I have come to know Him, and does not keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. So John very clearly tells us there, how do you know you're a Christian? Well, one of the ways you know you're a Christian is because you obey the commandments of God. If I say I'm a Christian, I've had a vision, I've been baptized, I've taken the Lord's Supper, I've, I've done all these things, and yet I don't keep God's commandments, the Bible says I'm a liar. That is really serious, isn't it? I'm a liar, and the truth is not in me. Well, someone reading that may say to themselves now, all right, that's, that's very serious. Give me an example of a command that God gives us. Give me a more specific uh, requirement, a more specific test. Not just simply commandments in general, but give me specifically one command for me to test myself by. And that's what John does now. We're going to be looking at verses 7 through 11. And I want us to look at the command of love today. It's been said by another that in the New Testament, love is not a thing. Love is the thing. And there's much truth in that. 
And we know the Apostle John as the Apostle of love. He was once a son of thunder, wanting to cast down judgment upon people. But now he speaks so much about love. He's, he's the Apostle of love. And that means he tells the truth, though, too, doesn't he? But he's the Apostle of love. And what we have before us today is a test of love, if you want to put it that way. It's, it's the commandment of love that John's going to give us to test ourselves. One of the reasons it's so important for us to think of love the way we are today is because you can do a lot of things, and I can do a lot of things in life, and not love. I can believe in the real Jesus. Amen? I can believe in the deity of Christ. I can believe in the humanity of Christ. I can believe in the second coming of Christ. I can even have my second coming theology down to a certain system. I can believe in a certain Jesus. And in one sense, I can guard myself from sin. I can try very hard to obey God's commandments. And yet if I don't love, I'm nothing. That's what we read earlier, isn't it? Uh, There's so many dangers in the Christian life. It's been said that walking in truth is like walking on a razor blade. You can fall off of either side. There's so many dangers in the Christian life. It's like when you've got something at home and it's broke, you got a washing machine or something, it's not working, and you look it up online and you say, well, it's an easy fix. You go, and you're not an expert, you're a YouTuber, and you go and you try to fix it, it doesn't fix your problem. Why? Because you investigate it some more and you find out there's like eight things that could be wrong that's causing this. And in the Christian life, there's all types of dangers. And we just have to to be careful and guard ourselves. And one of the biggest things we need to see, one of the greatest tests that you and I need to see is this test of love. That's what we're looking at today. I want us to think about five main things today. This is the first one. I want us just to think about the commandment itself. Look in verse 7 and 8. The Bible says, Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you. What he means by that is, this is, this is something that's old. That's what he says. But an old commandment. He says, I'm writing something to you that's old. Why is it old for? which you have had from the beginning. He says, you've had this commandment. This is the commandment to love one another. He says, you've had this commandment since the very beginning of your Christian life. When Jesus came to earth, the commandment was there. In fact, if you look back in the Old Testament, in chapter 19 of the book of Leviticus, most people, many people think of the book of Leviticus as some some dry book all about sacrifices that mean absolutely nothing for our life anymore. The reality is this. In chapter 19 of Leviticus, chapter 18 speaks about a lot of things. One thing is homosexuality. Chapter 20 speaks about a lot of things. Again, more sexual sin there in chapter 20. Right in the middle, it says, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. This commandment to love one another is an old commandment. It's from the beginning of Christianity. It's from the, it's in the Old Testament. And even before God created the world, the Bible says God is love, so therefore, of course, love was there. And when He did create, obviously it was going to be that all of us are to love one another. This is an old commandment, He says. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment. I want you to notice the word commandment there, like it's been brought out before. When you think about love, we're not thinking about something that's just sentimental. You know, well, how do you know you love that person? Well, I just feel happy when I'm around that person. Feelings are important. I'm not saying feelings aren't. But when the Bible calls this a commandment to love one another, it's talking about our will. It's talking about a decision, a grace-enabled decision. We not only wait for a feeling to happen, we just simply go and love people. We act. We have a decision to make. It's it's of the will. I see that person there. They did something wrong to me. At least I think they did last week or two weeks ago. But you know what? I'm going to love that person anyway. I'm not going to wait till a feeling comes. I'm going to love that person from the depths of my heart with God's help. I'm going to do that. It's It's a commandment. It's a decision. It's also clearly something that God works within us, but He gives us the command and we trust Him to meet our need 
to give us love for people. It's a commandment of love. It's an old commandment. And it says again in verse 7, starting after the word beginning, the old commandment is the word which you have heard. So John says this commandment is old. He also tells us so this commandment is new. Look in verse 8. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment. Now what's he mean by a new commandment? He just says it's old. Well, in one sense, it's old. It was from the beginning of your Christian life. It's from the Old Testament. It's before we were born. Yes, it's old in that sense, but it's new in another sense. Now, what's he mean by that? I think, in part at least, he's thinking back to John 13. I want you to listen to what Jesus says in John 13. <clears throat> of course, the same author wrote John who, as who wrote 1 John. Here's what Jesus says. This is very soon He's going to be dying here in the Gospel of John. Uh, chapter 13 roughly is the transition point in the Gospel of John. The first 12 chapters of John covers roughly three years of Jesus' ministry. The last eight chapters or so of the Gospel of John covers a couple days roughly. It's, he's with his disciples. Look what it says and listen to what it says in verse one of chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, he would, de- that he would depart out of this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He knows he just has a couple days, or less than a couple days at this point, as far as being and teaching at least with his disciples. And He loves them. And listen to what He says in verse 34 and 35. Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you. Now what's He going to say to them? This is a new commandment, right? What's He going to say? A new commandment I give to you. That you love one another. Now you may be thinking, that's not new though. That's from Leviticus 19. Here's what he says next. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. It's new because there's a new example that raises up what love means. Yes, we are to love one another as we love ourselves. That is so true. But here comes the Son of God, God in the flesh, walking on earth. He comes to earth and He's getting ready to bear the wrath of God for our sins. He's getting ready to die for the unrighteous. And Jesus says, I want you, here's a new commandment, love one another as I have loved you. It's an old commandment. But friends, it's a new commandment. Because it's been raised to a different level now. Just the way that Jesus gave His life for His disciples, that's the way we're supposed to give our lives for each other. That's, a di- that's not the American way of thinking about things, right? That's not the, the modern way of thinking about things. But here's the issue. We as Christ followers, that's what a Christian is, We as Christ followers, we are to give our lives for one another. And I know I need to do better. All of us, I would say, probably would confess in our heart, we want to love more. We want to do better for Christ. So this commandment that John is giving us here in 1 John 2, it's old and yet it's new. Here's the second thing I want you to see in verse 8. We're back in 1 John chapter 2. I want you to see the hater or the man who hates his brother. This is the man, you can think of verse 7 and 8 as the test of love, the command of love. Verse 9, excuse me, is where we're at now. Verse 9 gets into the man who fails the test. Let's start in verse 9. The one who says, now we've heard about this, we've met this man before, haven't we? The one who says, he's a big talker. Chapter 1, verse 6, If we say that we have fellowship with Him, and yet walk in the darkness. That's a false profession. Verse 8, If we say that we have no sin. Verse 10, If we say that we have not sin. Verse 4, The one who says, 
And now we go to verse 9. Again, it's the same false convert, maybe a false teacher is being presented here. And John says, it, the one who says he's in the light. And what that should help us all see and also help us to try to help other people, that should help us see that our confession of Christ, though that is important certainly in one sense, our confession of Christ means absolutely nothing if it's not backed up with true belief and a true life. It means nothing. It means nothing. I've preached for 18 years. It means nothing. If, if in my heart I'm not truly walking with Christ and in the light, if that's not true of me, the 18 years I've preached is going to do nothing but give me a greater judgment when I die because I'm more accountable to God for what I've done. And in fact, I've sinned more because I've been in the position I'm in before people preaching, teaching. A confession of faith means nothing if it's not backed up by a life of holiness. The one who says he is in the light... This, he's been talking about light and darkness so much here at the early parts of 1 John. We know we're in the light if we walk in the light as God is in the light. You remember chapter 1 verse 5, God is light. We know we're in the light if we confess our sins. We know we're in the light if we walk in His commandments. We know we're in the light if we walk like Jesus. That's not talking about sinlessness. None of us want to sin if we're Christians. We want to live holy. And yet, if we have been saved, our life has truly been changed. We're not the same people we used to be. But this man in verse 9, he's making a confession of being in the light. The one who says he is in the light, and here it comes, and yet hates his brother. Oh, what a thing that is. The brother, this is not talking about a physical brother though certainly we are to love our physical family. This is talking about loving a fellow Christian, whether it's a brother or sister. How do we know that we're not Christians? It's if we hate other Christians. Now here's what one of the big things I want to bring out to you today is that this hatred is deceptive. It's deceptive. Few people in our area are walking around right now telling everybody, hey, you see that Christian over there? I hate that person. In fact, we may say there's not one person in here of us who have ever heard someone deliberately say, I hate that Christian. Maybe you have. Maybe you haven't. The hatred that John is saying and talking about is not some kind of hatred where people are going to be going around and just confessing their hatred. and It's going to be a deceptive hatred. In many ways, it's going to be a secret hatred. Holding of grudges against people. Not helping people when we should help them. Uh, Seeing our brother or sister in need and closing our heart against them, as John says later in this book. Seeing someone who needs something, we pray for them, but the whole time we've got what they need behind us and we don't give it to them. That's what James talks about. It's going to be the issue of in our hearts, we we may help someone, but in our hearts we just, I don't want to help this person, I hate them. We don't want to be around them because we have more fellowship with the lost world than we do Christians. This hatred crops up in so many different ways. Let me give you an example from Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5 is a scary, scary verse. We're going to look at two verses. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 and 22. You have heard, this is Jesus speaking, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. Now, I don't know everyone's background. I'm not asking about everybody's background. But most likely, if we had someone in here, not in self-defense, but if we had someone in here who had just simply murdered somebody in the past, and they've never come to God, they've never received that cleansing, they've never come forth with that, they would feel very guilty, wouldn't they? At at even the, the sound of the word murder. But to God, 
Hating somebody is murder of the heart. Look what he says in verse 22. But I say to you that everyone who is angry, not who murders his brother with his hands, but angry. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, or rakah, your Bibles may say, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. That's how God views it. We may never have slain anyone with our hands. We have may, may never have had blood literally on our hands. But if we have hated men in our hearts, we have blood on our hearts. And that's condemning just like blood on our hands. And I think the, the majority of us, myself included, we need to be careful for this anger, this unrighteous anger in our heart, and we need to do anything we can to get rid of it. Amen. To be done with it. To confess it. If you've got anger in your heart at, at a brother or sister, and you're, you're angry, and you're, maybe you're slandering them in your heart, as happens sometimes, and it shouldn't happen, but it does, and, and you've got that, you need to confess that before God and receive forgiveness for that. Because 1 John chapter 2 says, the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. What that means is he's never been saved. That does not mean that a Christian can never ever have hatred in their heart. We know as Christians that happens, but we need to confess that and get rid of it. That's not saying... One, we don't want to sin at all. Don't get me wrong, but I'm not saying, and the Bible's not saying, as Christians, if we have hatred one moment in our heart, we were never saved. That's not what it's saying here. If we have hatred, we need to confess that. Ask God to forgive us for that. But what's going on here is the person who's living in this. That's, that's who they are. It's, they're hating their brothers and sisters. He says, you may have been baptized, you may have walked an aisle, you may do all types of helps, you may pray, you may do all this. He says you're, you've never even been a Christian yet, is what John says. If that's, the, if that's the way we live, we're not even, we've never even taken the first step of grace, John says. There's another man here in our passage, though. We see this command of love. We see the man who fails at the hater. We see the lover, though, in verse 10. The Christian, the man who loves. Look what, look what it says in verse 10. The one who loves. Now again, that is more than sentimentality. You may not be as emotional as the person sitting beside you. That doesn't mean you don't love people necessarily. Love is more than a feeling. It's more than getting worked up. Now that's part of love. Let's be honest. We do want to feel things in our heart. Let's, we don't want to minimize that. But you don't want to put that in the first place. Love is an emotion in one sense, and yet John's primary focus here, I believe, is not the feeling or the emotion that all of us want to have and all of us want to grow in. Primarily, John is talking about the actions of love. He wants us to love men and women through our actions. We see a need, we want to meet that need. We see a brother or sister who's put themselves in a position where they're, they're, they have a need. We want to sacrificially help that brother or sister. Someone may say, what's well, their fault? Well, maybe that needs to be addressed, but here's the thing. That brother or sister still has that need, right? And they still need help. They want help. We may see love working in, in many different ways, being kind to one another, being forgiving to one another. We may see love being simply Christian fellowship. I mean, if I love the brothers, I want to be with the brothers. I, I desire to be with them. It's my heart's desire to be with people who love the Lord Jesus. It's this, this love. The one who loves his brother abides in the light. He remains in the light. What's that mean? That means everything that we've looked at so far is true of him. He doesn't want to sin. 
when, when, when this good Christian does sin, he hates it, he, re, he confesses his sin, and Jesus is his advocate in heaven, the Bible tells us. He walks in the light as God is in the light. He confesses his sins. He keeps God's commandments. He's a transformed man. He, he's in the light. He is truly in the light. And look what it says at the end of verse 10. In the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in Him. There is no cause for stumbling in Him. And what I believe that is looking at is it's saying that as we walk in the light, as Jesus is in the light, the picture is we see what's going on and there's no reason for us to sin. Like there's no reason for us to trip up. If we do trip up and fall, it's our own fault, but we have no reason to because we're in the light. We've been changed. We see what's going on. That leads to the fourth thing I want you to see. And it's the, the awful, terrible position the man who hates is in. That's in verse 11. And it's going back to verse 10. At the end of verse 10, it talks about those who are walking in the light. They've got no reason to stumble. And then here comes verse 11 that tells this terrible, terrible position the hating man is in, or the hating woman is in. Verse 11, But the one who hates... Let me pause there. Let Again, let us with all of our might, brothers and sisters, let us with all of our might, by God's help and grace, remove any hatred from our hearts. Let us be done with it. Let us be done with it. But the one who hates his brother, it says, is in the darkness. It doesn't stop there. He's in the, that's bad enough, isn't it? He's in the darkness. He's not a Christian. He's in the darkness. But here's what it says next. And walks in the darkness. It's an awful thing to be in darkness. It's another thing to try to be walking around in that darkness. Now all of you probably know, have this experience, you're at home, whatever reason, it's dark, you're walking in the dark, but you kind of know where you're at. It's your house and you can feel around. That's not the position here of this man. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness, and listen to this, and does not know where he is going. Here is a man, he's in the darkness. Here is a man, he's walking in this darkness. Here is a man or a woman, they do not know where they're going in this darkness. And then, that's not all. Because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Here's what I take from this verse. Not only is hatred a terrible thing, but hatred is going to lead us to a terrible end, a destruction. Because at the end of verse 10, just like the man who loves his brother has no reason for stumbling, in verse 11, the man who is in darkness and walking in darkness doesn't know where he's going, he's blind, he has every reason to stumble, and he will stumble one day and be destroyed. That's the end of the man who hates He's walking around. He doesn't know what's going. It's, it's, a, it's a mercy of God that he's even still alive on this earth. But one day, it's going to happen. It has to happen. He's going to trip and he's going to be destroyed. He's going to be done. I mean, how, he can't do anything else. He's in darkness. And that's a picture of how dangerous hatred is in our life as Christians. But here, it's how dangerous and and damning it is for someone to live in this hatred and show themselves not to be a Christian. It's been, it's not been that long ago, but sometime in the past this year, I, I walked to the church building. I was doing a little bit of work here late at night, and it got dark outside. And I started around the way, and I started walking back home. I got to about over here in the grass in front of the church building. I stepped on something. I stepped back, got my phone out and turned the light on. I stepped on a rattlesnake. Only started rattling, I think, after I stepped on it. And I took that at least to be God saying to me, Clint, that anger in your heart's going to kill you. Because I don't even remember what it was, but I had some anger in my heart while I was working here. I, I just, I just can, I confess that to you. 
I was angry about something, and I walked out, stepped on a rattlesnake. Anger will kill us. That was a mercy of God. I wasn't bitten. But it is a mercy of God that He has allowed hate, hateful, hating people to remain on His earth. And we who are Christians, He's allowed us to have hate and not taken us out of this life. We need to endeavor of all of our might as Christians to remove any hatred. To ask God to forgive us of anything in our heart. To forgive us for holding anything against anyone. Look what it says in James. James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. And then in chapter 5 of James, verse 9, Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. I don't want to have, even as a Christian, I don't want to have any anger, any bitterness in my heart whatsoever. And that's the danger that Hebrews talks about in chapter 12. It talks about a root of bitterness taking hold because the anger and hatred in our hearts have not been dealt with and this root of bitterness has sprung up and it corrupts many people. With all of our mights, we need to do what we can to take up the root of anger, ask God to forgive us, confess our sins, and be done with it. And give it to God and say, God, I don't want this anymore. Take it from me. I'm through with it. I'm done. You are coming back one day. I want to be ready to meet you and not have hatred all over inside my heart and soul. Let me give you a few things today that may help you. One thing I want you to see is 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 4. Verse 9 and 10. Before we read that first, let me say this. You may be here and, and God has, has shined His spotlight on your heart. You say, my, oh my, I am hating. I am more hating than I thought I was. I don't even know if I've ever loved anybody before, like the Bible tells me to. Listen, if, if, you, if God has revealed that to you, you need to do business with God. You need to pray that God changes your heart. You need to read the promises of God. You need... You need to ask God to give you a loving heart. That's not something you can do. I can't make myself love. I am commanded to love. So by God's grace, I take it. I say, as an act of will, I will love. That is true. And yet at the same time, I cannot have these loving feelings and compassion toward people without Him. You need to go to God and ask Him to give you a loving heart. And to take out the heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh and and to give you a heart that loves and weeps at times over over people and over things happening and, and give you a heart that can be touched and has compassion on people again all of us have different personalities all of us sometimes you're not going to feel as much as somebody else but we all feel though if we love that's very true And the number one thing you need to do is have a heart that loves God because when the love of God is poured out into your heart, you can't help but love everybody. When the love of God has been poured out into your heart and you know your sins are forgiven, you love everyone. You can't help it. It's a natural process. When God's love is poured forth, you love. It's that simple. But here in 1 Thessalonians 4, it's an amazing statement. You may be here and you're a Christian. You say, you know what? I do love. I do love. I do love. But boy, I want to love more. That's the way I feel. I want to love a lot more. Well, look what it says here. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you. You do love, he says. You love. 
For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. He says, God has been your teacher. That's an amazing statement. If you are a Christian, that can be said of you. God is our teacher. He says, God has taught you how to love. But look what he says in verse 10. It's amazing. For indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in, in all Macedonia. But here's the amazing part I want you to see. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. That's an amazing statement. First of all, he says, God, he says, Thessalonians, God has taught you how to love. You don't need anybody to teach you. God's taught you. And then he says, but I want you to love more. <laughs> God has been your teacher, but he still wants you to love more. And that's true for, if we, if we are Christians this morning, God has taught us to love and we may be at a different place, but we truly do love. You know what God says to us? Love more. Love more. You know when I love my wife the most? It's when I love God the most. Get your heart in love with God. Meet with God by His grace. Let His Word thrill you. Pray and have His peace put in your heart. And friends, you'll love people more. Give yourself to Him more and more and more. That's a big thing, isn't it, about love? You know, maybe when I was a younger preacher, maybe some of you can understand this. When I was a younger preacher, I may have thought it was an easy thing to preach and teach on love. As you hopefully begin to grow, as I have hopefully began to grow, you start to see maybe just a little bit that not only is love not an easy thing, love is an impossible thing to preach and teach on. Because it's so much. God has called us to love. He has called us to care for one another. He has called us to give our lives for one another. And here's one thing about love. You can't hide it. You can't hide love. It's like a, a, a good smelling meal in the oven. You just can't hide that aroma, can you? You smell it. It attracts people. You cannot hide love. So for us as Christians, we who love, that's a sign that we know God, but if we do have that love in our heart, it will show itself somehow, maybe in acts of kindness, maybe in prayers that, true, maybe nobody will ever know our prayers, but we'll see the effects of them. Maybe it's reaching out a helping hand to somebody, maybe it's being with your brothers and sisters, you want to fellowship because you love one another. Maybe it's, when possible, coming to church early, church service early, so you can be around people before service. You can hear their needs. You can, you can hear what they're going through. You know how to pray. You know how to bring something to them. Love will show itself in different ways. And if you love like the Bible instructs us to love, you are a Christian. And we ought to rejoice in that.